Yeah, hey, Alex, how is everyone? Chris, Hi. hello, hello. we're live. Welcome hello, we're live. to our panel. Welcome to the Modiphius panel. Chris, yeah. why don't you Hi, start everyone. us off? Thanks for joining us. You're uh, with the Modiphius crew uh, of our very own journey through the Star Trek uh, universe. Um, we've got a fantastic uh, body of people here to, uh, to host you. I'm going to introduce, um, so we've got uh, Nathan. Do you want to introduce yourself, Nathan? Yeah, uh, I'm the uh, lead designer developer for the 2D20 system at Modiphius. So, yeah, the rules for Star Trek Adventures are my work. You can blame me for those. <laughs> Great. And we've got uh, Jim Johnson as well. Hi, I'm Jim Johnson. I'm the project manager for Star Trek Adventures at Modiphius. So uh, Nathan does all the rules and I'm responsible for getting all the products together and getting the writers wrangled and uh, putting those things together and herding all the cats and tribbles. <laughs> and, uh, and the wonderful uh, Rick Sternbach. Hey, I'm Rick. Uh, <laughs> I've been uh, a, a space and, and science fiction artist uh, mm, since the early 70s. And uh, I guess my connection to uh, Modifius is uh, answering questions and, uh, you know, giving little, little, uh, little uh, tips and things about uh, tech. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> right. And uh, Kelly? I am Kelly, and I am a contributing writer to the Star Trek Adventures Klingon Core Rulebook and other upcoming projects. Awesome. And Keith? I am Keith R. A. DeCandido. I have written a ridiculous amount of uh, Star Trek fiction, a lot of which focuses on Klingons, which is why Jim Johnson came, got in touch with me and said, hey, want to write some stuff for the Klingon Core Rulebook? And I said, uh, OK. And mm -hmm. um, most recently, I've also done the Klingon Art of War, uh, which was a, a guide to how to live your life as a proper warrior, um, and also several chapters in the Klingon Core Rulebook. Brilliant. And then Derek? Hi, I'm Derek Tyler Attico. I'm also a contributor to uh, the Klingon Core Rulebook, and um, I'm a former Strange Star Trek Strange New Worlds uh, winner. And uh, Sam? Yeah, last but not least, I am the head of product now at Modifians Entertainment. Uh, I started off working as the kind of project manager on Star Trek Adventures, getting it out when we first released the original core rule book all those years ago. Wasn't that long ago, to be fair. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> um, uh, helped out um, on some of the restructuring rewrite on the Klingon core book, which I'm very, very proud of and what we're here mm -hmm. to talk about today. Great. Well, look, we'll, we'll get started um, very quickly. I'm, uh, we're going to just uh, talk about where it, all, where it all came from. And actually, um, I, I've been a Star Trek fan all my life. I remember sitting on my knees watching Kirk in front of uh, the old TV as a kid. And wow. uh, it was a bit of a dream come true to uh, be able to work with Star Trek. And funnily enough, um, it was um, a friend at Star Trek Online who was involved previously, who I got talking to and said, oh, I know the people at CBS. Why don't you have a chat to them about the Star Trek license? And to cut a long story short, about three years later, after lots of talking about it, we finally got that contract through. And it was, uh, yeah, it was quite a magic moment to go, wow, we're going to do Star Trek. <laughs> So, uh, and, uh, you know, it was amazing, really. So, and here we are. It's incredible that, you know, it's already a few years later. And, um, you know, we, we reached out. We, um, I remember we had like a whole crew of about 15,000 people that helped us do the first play test. They each got to pick a, a preferred ship uh, uh, with the living campaign. And it was a real great community spirit. We had so many people come out of the woodwork in the tabletop hobby to work with us on the game. And one of the, the things I remember, Sam, uh, right at the beginning, we, mm. we tried to come at this from a different angle because there had been really good Star Trek role-playing games before. And we thought, well, um, aside from the fact we're gonna use all new art, kind of uh, graphic novel style art, um, we wanna tell a personal story mm. through the books, didn't we? So- um, I remember your pitch, yeah. yeah. Um, it was very much that we wanted to tell Star Trek's story from a kind of um, like a different angle almost. So it was about having different things, about having like Obsidian Order reports on something that famously happened in one of the series or, uh, you know, uh, again, like a Klingon perspective of some of the events that maybe happened from some of the films of the original series. You know, it, because I think other previous role-playing games and it, it was something 
uh, maybe of the time, or it's something that still happens now. A lot of role play games take a very top down view when they talk about a setting, whereas we really wanted to get in there. And I remember you saying that it was very much the, you know, you want the tone of the body of the text to be like, almost like an admiral talking to a new captain. So it's not that, you know, it's hello player, this is what's going on and we're, we're, we're kind of devoid from it. It was like, we're gonna put you in here, you're going out there, you've got a ship, you've got to know all this stuff before you leave. It was that kind of, and that was quite exciting, I think, for me when I was coming on board that, yeah. Yeah, and it definitely made it, I think, a lot more personal for a lot of people. So, mm. you know, I remember, mm. you know, we had like, you know, personal communiques and messages, you know, Romulans talking about Starfleet and Klingons talking yeah. about Romulans and yeah. so on. And it, it was and a different fictional way, sidebars. It? Yeah, definitely. That was the book. It really worked. And we also um, uh, involved a lot of people at the beginning to help us get Star Trek right. I mean, one thing we always work hard at is making something authentic. And you you can't just throw out a, uh, a Star Trek game and get everything wrong. So one of the people we turned to was Rick, uh, Rick Sternbach, who uh, knew a lot of the, the technology, the, the ships um, inside out. And... Um, was a real source of inspiration and facts uh, and um, uh, particularly helped us with things like the Klingon deck plans that we we produce. But mm. uh, Rick, we came to you at the beginning, didn't we, to um, just help us out and uh, check some of the stuff we were doing. And um, it was really great to have you involved. Yeah, I, I, I had a great time and thanks for, for bringing me on board with this. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people can can dive into uh, you know a science fiction uh, uh, scenario like this, and it might take just a kind you know just a couple of little tweaks here and there to make it perfect. Okay, and I I, I remember on on some of the uh, some of the Klingon room uh, uh, some of the the renders of uh, you know engineering spaces and storage areas and all this. Um, it, you know, they, they look, they look fine, but they needed to be more Klingon. Right. And how do you do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and one of the easy ways was put the darn emblem on the floor. <laughs> Just everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, you know? Okay. You know, and, and yes, the, you know, I think the Klingons themselves, uh, you know, in, in some cases, would would just plaster this this emblem uh, this triangle symbol um, you know in various places okay right. and and yeah. yes visually it's it's in your face but it tells you right off the bat yes this is Klingon and not somebody else like Romulan or Cardassian um, uh, you know the colors are a big thing um, mm. and and even even little things like just shapes of stuff on the walls, okay, uh, can tell you what culture built this hardware. Mm. Um, you know, and, and for, for me, especially when, you know, when I was working on, uh, on the shows, um, you, you know, a, a visual cue uh, could instantly tell the audience, okay, who is this? You know what are they doing, and how do they differ from the other cultures? Mm, that's a good point. And you, you particularly were involved with one of the ships, the uh, Vorcha, weren't you, in terms of designing that? Yeah, that that came up uh, that came up back on Next Gen, and uh, you know, I we got um, uh, you know we got the script. I don't recall the exact episode, but uh, it called for this this new flagship. Uh, one of the directives from uh, our, our executive producer, Rick Berman, was it had to be smaller than Picard's Enterprise. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, most, most alien craft could not be bigger than the Enterprise D. Okay. Yeah. All right, fine. I could work with that. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, it, you know, when it came to designing the Vorcha, all right, what other Klingon craft did we have to look at? Well, it would go all the way back to Matt Jeffries with the original, uh, uh, you know, battle cruiser. Okay, what shapes say this is Klingon? Okay, well, we know, you know, we know from the original series, we know from Star Trek, the motion picture, uh, uh, you know, and some of the other features, 
that, uh, it, you know, it had this angular body, it had this long neck, you had this uh, command section up front. Um, how do, you know, how do you work with those iconic shapes, um, you know, and, and kind of bring the Vorcha uh, up into the next gen era? Uh, so I, I got a little bit more angular with it than, uh, than Matt Jeffries did, uh, but I kept a lot of the same basic masses, the sa a lot of the same basic shapes, uh, fiddled with the nacelles, um, but you could still look at the Vorcha, you know, having not seen it before and say, okay, yes, this is a Klingon ship. Uh, had a had an absolute ball with it, and I got I can tell you one of the things I did with the uh, the big forward disruptor in the nose was okay. This was a direct tip of the hat to uh, you know just about every anime spaceship out there with a huge gun. <laughs> <laughs> and Rick, there's another iconic ship the for the Klingons, the Bird of Prey, and you. I know you um, you helped work on the um, the uh, the manual, the Haynes manual for that, and you, you said there was something interesting about the scaling on that. Yeah, well, the you know the 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 bird of prey, what you know what they ended up uh, calling the Burrell class, uh, and uh, you know eventually becoming uh, General Martok's you know flagship. I mean, it's a little ship. All right, why didn't he go for something like a Vorcha? All right, well. <laughs> he had his reasons, right? Uh, but when it came time to do the Haynes manual and break down uh, the ship into various decks, uh, command areas, engineering areas, uh, you know, I, I looked at the original uh, miniature uh, that uh, ILM built, okay? And uh, uh, folks like Bill George and John Goodson, uh, uh, you know, sent me photos of the miniature and I could kind of tell based on the spacing of the windows, you know, uh, along the height of the, of the ship, uh, okay, how big could these decks be? How big could these windows be? How does this translate into a full-size vehicle? Um, and I kind of made things work within, you know, within the context of, of the Haynes book. Uh, this thing is 139 meters long. Okay, it you know it's got a certain size crew. Everything fits within <laughs> that volume. Okay, and I was just I, I was like, like, "Phew, this works. This is great. Okay, this is terrific." Now, I remember because um, you, you weren't even really using uh, like modern day computers when you were putting these together. You were kind of I remember you saying that you were having to plot them out um, on really old school software, weren't you? So it's not like uh, you had all the tools that we have now. Oh, for the, for the Haynes manual, no, I, I, had, I had my full Mac and scanner yeah. and printer and, and the, whole, the whole nine yards. Uh, with the next generation, uh, with the enterprise deck plans that went back to 1994, no, that was back in the dim times. <laughs> Before <laughs> okay, times. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yes, we, we had our computers, okay, but they were not like the equipment we have today. So for the Haynes book, I had everything I needed, okay? Right, yeah. um, I was able to sketch out the decks. I was able to hardline them in uh, Adobe Illustrator, you know, terrific vector program, uh, printed out every deck to scale, and yeah. just... You know, my, my dad was an architect. He put all this, this technical stuff in my head and I got to putting pieces and parts together for this, this Burrell class. Okay, I didn't design the ship, but I sure as heck was able to figure out what went inside it. Yeah, okay. you want, it wasn't. Work cars. Um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, we worked out the, uh, the impulse engines um, uh, the, uh, the wings on the Burrell, okay, contained essentially the, uh, uh, what we would think of as the warp nacelles, okay, well, most warp nacelles are round things with lots of coils inside. 
for the for the uh, bird of prey, they're flat sheets that get mm -hmm. juiced up with yeah. matter antimatter plasma. Okay, and it flies that way. Yeah, <laughs> I remember reading that in the manual. It was yeah. something that we actually spent a lot of time with, even down to uh, crew stuff and like you know, I uh, <laughs> some of the little bit I'm most proud of of the core book is a little bit about like the chef and how important they are on the ship. Um, <laughs> but it was like it, it it went into so much detail. It must have been like kind of putting together this puzzle piece of knowing all the bits that you had to get in there and then working out actually how it all worked. It must have been a joy. Oh, it, 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 it was fun. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the, the early sketches that I had were on, you know, big flat sheets of paper. Uh, and I started working out, OK, let's see, the, the fabrication laboratory can go here. Uh, you know, photon torpedo storage can go over here and over here. And, uh, you know, every little thing fell into place. Now, this all worked for me because I had like you know, 20 years worth of this stuff going back to when I worked on the shows. Yeah. Okay. We were dreaming this stuff up every single day. Yeah. And so it wasn't always um, plans that you had to deal with because you were telling us that you had some uh, interesting moments with props and, and prop guns for the Klingons. <laughs> yeah. Um, back on Next Generation, uh, there was, uh, there was one episode where some of the Klingons were thrown into the brig on the Enterprise, okay? And, uh, well, you know, the, their, their disruptor pistols were taken away, sure. But they, had, they were sneaky and they, they <laughs> built a disruptor out of parts of their boots and their belt buckles and that sort of thing, okay? And that was very clever. I thought that was, that was a super thing to work in to the story. Well, you know, I, I designed, uh, uh, you know, a finished prop that could be assembled, you know, uh, on screen. And, uh, you know, one morning during this episode, okay, I'm at my table up in the art department and Joe Longo, who was our prop master, uh, I'm, I'm missing terribly. We lost him a few years back and uh, Joe came up with a cardboard box and he, <laughs> he said, can you fix this before they shoot after <laughs> noon? And I'm saying, fix what? And it's the prop and it's, it's broken. All right. Somebody dropped it on the floor and it was made out of uh, uh, clear resin and some other little bits and pieces. And I said, oh, you're lucky I got my paints and my super glue. <laughs> <laughs> So I put it together and I, and I, you know, I put a little bit of paint on it and, uh, you know, it, it was all nice and solid and dry again. Joe came up just before they went back to shooting. <laughs> and I went back to my work. Wow. And you, cause you've always been so passionate. I mean, we can see behind you the ships and I know you, you're always um, very passionate about space as a, as a, as a topic anyway, aren't you, Rick? Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I have been so lucky, um, you know, who, to, to have been connected with the Star Trek franchise, because to me, Star Trek and real ex space exploration have gone together for decades. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Star Trek came on the scene when the Mercury program was finished. The Gemini astronauts were starting to go up in pairs. And, uh, you know, the, the first pitch for the, the Star Trek pilot happened in 1964, okay? And, and it was just a wonderful time, all right, for me as a kid, all right, to, to watch the, the, the whole, uh, you know, to watch space exploration happen, you know, on the U.S. side, on the Russian side, uh, uh, all of this was happening and I could watch it on te television. Okay. Um, and, you know, just, just through all of these various sets of circumstances and writing letters and making phone calls, you know, I was able to join up with the franchise uh, for the motion picture. Um, and, you know, and, and, 
as they say, the, the rest is history. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think each of us here can probably point to, you know, we've all been inspired by Star Trek. And, uh, and I, you know, I hear so many stories about people at NASA who were inspired to join because yeah. of Star Trek. And it's, it's really incredible that the world has this sort of, um, you know, so many people around the planet have been so affected by a great sci-fi show, but it's, you know, it's it's not like any of the other sci-fi films that, you know, it's it's particularly people cite Star Trek as the thing that made them so excited about, you know, working in space or working in sci-fi. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. And, and, you know, myself included, you know, going after Star Trek, you know, it's been such a wonderful show, and especially because of the message behind Star Trek of diversity and, and um, you know, caring for others around you. And the fact that we, you know, that the, uh, the classic line, Sam, we were talking about the other day, uh, infinite diversity is, you know, just really rings home mm -hmm. at the moment. So, um, Jim, I wanted to hand over to you um, uh, obviously with time moving on to talk uh, with the gang here about our Klingon book um, uh, and uh, just share some stories about the book, some of the um, how we got to produce the book and let everyone kind of talk about their involvement. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Rick. I love, I, I could just sit here for a whole hour just listening to the stories that you have. I mean, we could just, we could just sit back and just let you do it all. I mean, that'd be great. But, <laughs> um, we'll have to plan that again for the future. Uh, but yeah, so let's talk about the Klingon book just a little bit. So it was uh, over a year now, maybe uh, maybe last June in 2019, uh, Sam and I were talking about the about the game line because he was transitioning over to become the head of product mm -hmm. at Modiphius. And I was taking on the, the role of project manager for Star Trek Adventures. And we were talking about, okay, where do we go next? Because we had a lot of books that we were kind of tidying up from the first wave. And we're like, okay, what's what's next? And, we're, and we thought about it. We're like, well we would like to do a new or at least a refreshed core book because we know that collectively, you know, Nathan's had three more years of experience working on different versions of the 2D20 system. Yeah. And then we had just tons and tons of fan feedback over the years about what was working in the game, what was confusing, what, you know, what was working with the game, what wasn't working. And uh, I know that, you know, myself and Nathan spend a lot of time on social media on all the different game forms, answering questions for fans, like how do these rules actually work? And we realized that there was an opportunity to kind of give the, the, the rule system kind of a top-down refresh, you know, not really changing anything because the rule system itself is, you know, fantastic and award-winning and everything else. And we were like, well, how do we, how do we kind of do that? And we're like, well, let's, let's, look at, let's look at a new core book and let's look at the Klingons because that's something cool that hasn't really been done for 30 years now. Facet did it way back in the yeah. in the late 80s and uh both last unicorn games and decipher both announced klingon books shortly before folding right you know last unicorn games folded and then uh, decipher got bought by wizards of the coast and so the, they announced the klingon book and then they never were able to to realize it and so if you were in the star trek uh you know in the get in the star trek gaming circles there was this kind of klingon curse that was happening like as soon as a game company announced the Klingon book, they would disappear. <laughs> hey, George, Jim, that is the secret. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I didn't start um, straight in at Modiphius as a, the line manager for Star Trek. I, I, I won my way in, but uh, <laughs> as of the story. But um, from, from kind of the beginning of the development on it and working with the manuscripts of the writers and creatives on it, I heard about this curse. And it, is always, it was always in the back of my mind that eventually I would like to get to making a Klingon book, whether that was um, a core book like we have or a source book kind of supplement mm -hmm. type thing. Yeah. But like you said, I thought that pitching it as a core rule book meant that it felt more like a standalone game. like, mm -hmm. And it had some real ownership. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, I think if we'd published it as a supplement, it would have been maybe felt a bit more almost secondary like it was like yeah you could you know starfleet's the main one but you can kind of play klingons if you want whereas this mm -hmm. is like kind of klingon loud and proud you know mm -hmm. um so i'm no really glad that to we... be klingon exactly right <laughs> so i'm really glad that um chris gave us the opportunity to actually um develop that as a as a proper yeah. core book because yeah. i think it's going to real really lend some strength to it as, as the game and it, like mm -hmm. you say it's given us a fantastic opportunity to uh, refine some of the rules and refine some of the kind of structuring and stuff like that and, and make a really good product 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it ties into that diversity angle that you were talking about a little bit too, where like, I know with the uh, the Starfleet Corps rule book, we, we kind of gave you the option that you, you could play Cardassians, you could play Romulans, you could play Klingons if you wanted to, but it was really Starfleet focused. And, and we knew that there are, there are very large numbers of fans out there who kind of want to play something different. They want to be a Klingon right. or they want to be a Romulan or they want to do something different. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you know, we have to be careful, you know, as far as the tone goes, right? We want everything still to fit in the Star Trek ethos and, and ideas and stuff. But the Klingons, you know, seem to be, you know, maybe next to the Vulcans are probably the most popular um, Star Trek species out there. And, and mm -hmm. this just seems like a great opportunity to to do it. So I, I'm going to uh, stop rambling about it a little bit. I just want to ask the writers I've got here. So Kelly and Derek and Keith uh, and Nathan and, uh, you know, even Sam, because you wrote a chunk of it too, just, you know, real quick, what, what are your first impressions like when you were invited to uh, to work on it? What, what did you think initially like, oh, you know, Klingon, Klingon core rule book? What, what were your thoughts? Uh, and I'll just start at the top. Uh, Kelly, what was your initial uh, initial thoughts on that? Uh, yay. <laughs> that, was my that was my first thought, but no, seriously, just the chance to get to explore some alternate perspectives. So Sam talked about this earlier, but I love the fact that these books really get multiple perspectives and we get to go, well, I, in, in the writing that I did, got to go visit some of uh, the familiar things in history. So you'll recognize the event, but it's told from the perspective of maybe an, a new character. Um, that we haven't seen yet. So that is just uh, all kinds of exciting. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. And Derek, what, you, you, Derek had the opportunity to work on the, uh, the world's chapter. So what, what did you bring to, what, what kind of perspective did you bring to that uh, as you were working well, on it? Well, thank you, Jim. Well, first I agree with Kelly, yay. And uh, <laughs> secondly, I, I've always felt that the Vulcans were like the, the, the head, or the head of, um, they were the ones that were the thinkers of Star Trek. And the Klingons were the emotional aspect of Star of Star Trek, and the humans were like in the middle, not the head or not the heart, you know. So, what I wanted to do was just do something that was very from a Klingon perspective, doing their worlds very emotional, not necessarily um, uh, liking everything about Starfleet, but just something that felt real and pure about about the Klingons. So I, I pretty much watched every episode read everything I could get my hands on from Mark Orland or on the Cleon um, um, language and just wanted to do stuff that was just from their perspective and, and in some ways they're very emotional and very aggressive. And uh, uh, Keith, what, what you, Keith had the opportunity to work on a couple of the lore chapters at the very beginning of the book. Uh, Keith, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your approach to it. Well, my, I, I'll third the A. Um, the, the, what, what I've always been interested in with the Klingons is really digging into what, what the culture is, what life is like for Klingons throughout the empire, not just the military people that we see normally, but also, um, different, different aspects of Klingon life beyond the politics and the military that, that the shows and the movies gave us. Um, but also the history, um, yeah, stuff that was hinted at in like uh, in Rightful Air, where we got some of the backstory on Kalis and some of the stories that Worf and others have told, um, and uh, things like you know Martok, somebody who came up from being a commoner and becoming uh, the leader of the Empire, uh, and so on. And so uh, th this gave me the opportunity to dig into that history a little bit, um, and and make use of as not just stuff that was established on screen but also stuff that was established in the comic books, in the FASA role-playing game, in various novels over the years, both by myself and others. So that was, that was a lot of fun to sort of bring all those disparate elements together and, and to flesh out some of the less well-known parts of, of Klingon life. Uh, and also, I love my favorite part was the sidebars. Uh, and I know, I think all three of us and, and many others did a lot of the different sidebars. I love doing those little, like, quick little vignettes that, that have so different aspects of things. I did one that was the last report given by the Klingon posing as Arn Darvin before he was captured um, right. to give that perspective on Trouble with Tribbles. Um, the, the, I, wrote, I wrote a song that's from an opera about mm -hmm. the Herc invasion. Mm -hmm. uh, little stuff like that, little things that sort of add to the, to the texture of, of the universe. Uh, and I was reading through the, the PDF of the final book and some of the other uh, sidebars were just wonderful. And it was like, oh, I wish I thought of that. <laughs> 
Awesome. Thank you. And so, yeah, so in, in addition to the writing that, uh, you know, Kelly and Derek and Keith and uh, so many other writers that uh, we had, uh, Scott Pearson and Dayton Ward and uh, gosh, Chris McCarver, uh, there's just so many writers in the credits list that we couldn't get them all, get them all on this call, obviously, because there would have been like 40 of us and we would have outnumbered the audience, which is, you know, totally okay. But uh, uh, we had to, you know, had to just go with who we could get. And it's great that you're all here and I'm grateful that you all took the time for it. So uh, in addition to all the lore and all the, all the great sidebars that we wrote, we also took a top-down approach to revising the, taking a fresh look at the rules and uh, uh, Sam and Nathan, you both were uh, really took the, took the ownership of the, of the rules chapters to refresh those and revise those. So I thought, you know, take a couple of minutes just to talk about some of the changes that you made and uh, maybe talk a little bit about how we how we represented the rules to make them a little clearer and easier to follow. And uh, even some of the new example text that we added in, uh, either one, uh, Chris or Nathan, go, or uh, Sam and Nathan, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I already had ownership of the rules chapters from the, the previous core book, um, mm -hmm. having spent um, several months um, churning those out for the original um, book around the same time that Star Trek arrived on Netflix, conveniently enough. Uh, so I have my research material available there. But uh, I mean, you watched every single episode. I right? watched every episode and all 10 uh, relevant movies. Yeah. And then as a present for myself, when I finished the first draft, I went to see Star Trek Beyond. Because <laughs> <laughs> the timing just fell, uh, fell together. Yeah, nice. um, but with the, the Klingon book, the opportunity did come up to go back and look at the areas where maybe we didn't have enough time to to polish the rules down to the to what they could be or to get the presentation just right. Um, and for for most of the rules chapters, um, Sam handled a lot of the representation um, in part because because I'd written them originally. I knew what I intended them to say, hmm. not necessarily, and couldn't necessarily clean them up for other people to understand. Hmm. You always need a second perspective for hmm. that, uh, and that is the sole, you know, particular purpose of a of a line editor, particularly when you're going through something like that, and particularly when you're uh, working on instructional language that is also creative because it's a role playing yeah. game rather hmm. than any other type of game. And so you're kind of, you're not only telling people kind of how to resolve the actions of the characters, mm. you're also giving them permission to do certain things mm. or you're encouraging them to act a certain way. Um, oh no, we've, someone's, someone, uh, Kelly's dropped. We've, yeah, uh, we've jumped Kelly. around. Well, hopefully, hopefully, she'll, hopefully, hopefully she'll come back. We'll keep talking, yeah. keep listening. Yeah. <laughs> well, and uh, hopefully we'll get the, Jake will get the, uh, the cameras all, all sorted back or she'll hop back in. Oh. Um, so yeah, it was it was good to, to take a fresh look at them, I think, and um, you know, hopefully not not butcher them, Nathan. Mm. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, there was um, there was a fair amount of um, what I tend to focus on, and, and I, I haven't looked back just very very recently at it, unfortunately for this. But I think my focus was more on kind of how how it was how you intuit the what's being said mm. um, to make sure that it's accessible uh, as we can make it. Um, aha, here we go. She's coming in, but we might be in lots of different places. Apologize, <laughs> guys. All right. <laughs> no worries. Welcome back, hey, Chris. And uh, I have the I have the uh, Twitch feed on a uh, separate channel, and I see that our all of our pictures got kind of swapped around. So hopefully the fans aren't too confused. Uh, we, we got yeah. uh, we're playing musical chairs with the uh, with the. Uh, we are a little. It's a bizarre so episode okay. of Celebrity so, yeah. Squares. No, I'm, yeah. I'm um, still me on the Twitch stream. No, you fine. are. Congratulations. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I did see. Uh, I did see one question on the Twitch. I just wanted to mention real quick. Uh, so we did take the opportunity to uh, refresh all of the. Uh, rules examples that are in the book and uh, 99 actually 98 99 percent of the rules examples that we created um, I followed Nathan's lead and pulled all of those examples as much as possible out of canon examples out of episodes mm. so mm -hmm. where we're at where we're trying to describe a specific rules situation we tried to find a specific you know scene in the in the canon that actually kind of described that and then we tried to write the rules around to that and I know I wrote a bunch of those and there were a lot of late night emails to Nathan saying, did I get this right? Did I get this right? Cause I know we're, cause he's busy working on a bunch of other games right now and mm -hmm. it can't focus on Star Trek like he did, you know, four years ago. Um, but uh, grateful that you were able to, uh, to look at those things for me, Nathan. And uh, oh, I love it. I love, I love the fact that you did that initially from the very beginning is that you took examples from Canon so mm. that, cause we knew, right. Like, like having listened to fans for the, for the last four years now, you know, they're watching the shows and they say, how can I do this moment, 
using the game rules and, yeah. and to try to be able to to spin that for them so they can understand it has been beneficial it, it, and i wanted felt, to make sure that came in it felt like the the easiest way to convey what the rules were supposed to represent to connect it to something that the people reading were already going to be familiar with mm -hmm. yeah and nathan could you talk a little bit since this is obviously the klingon book i uh, talk a little bit about the rules that you created for the uh, house uh, system creating your own house so, yeah the the main chapter that i um handled the rewrites for directly was character creation because it was the chapter that needed the most changes from the uh the starfleet focused version of the original core book so while the structure of character creation is pretty much the same a lot of the elements within it were rewritten to be klingon centric or you know klingon focused uh the events tables include a number of um significantly more aggressive um events than uh, the uh, the starfleet versions originally um and then there were a few sections which were completely written from scratch. One was um, handling the matter of a, a Klingon house. If you're playing a, a Klingon from a, a high-born family, then your house is obviously a major, major part of who the character is and the adventures that they will go on, the stories they'll tell, who their friends are, who their enemies are. And we wanted a system in there to handle that aspect that still fit relatively seamlessly into the rest of the character creation options and you know I, I feel that we succeeded there the other elements that got changed were um perhaps on a more a, a more personal note i was never a hundred percent happy with the character advancement and reputation rules from the the original book they were amongst the last things that we worked on and they never quite got the the, the play testing or the iteration that i wanted them to have um, so the opportunity to rebuild those from scratch, you know, I leapt at the opportunity. Sure. Uh, it took it actually took um, a bit of uh, took some time to convince Jim of the uh, the necessity of doing so, but because uh, <laughs> they were uh, quite different from the the original versions. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, building something that for for advancement that felt more like um, telling story arcs and having focus episodes and. That you know, going through that structure of the the TV shows, mm -hmm. um, and having characters have individual stories from episode to episode, separate from the big the the big picture arcs, mm -hmm. and then the reputation system having it as a way to create lasting friends and enemies and lasting consequences and benefits from acting honorably acting dishonorably for you know to have those have impact on the character rather than just be a little bit in the background that's that wasn't especially impactful and and back engineered those for starfleet games for people wanting a bit more of the um that feeling going forward as well and mm -hmm. then you know a few bits and pieces here and there to clear up mistakes in the older book right right sure. excellent Cool. And uh, Keith, I was curious, this is a question for you. Uh, obviously, since you have such a such a depth of experience working on Star Trek uh, novels and supplements and, and Klingon material, um, you know, and, and also because we, we are fortunate with the Star Trek Adventures license to have the ability to, to sneak in Easter egg references from comic books, from novels, from like the entire, you know, breadth of the of the intellectual property and and sneak you know things in where we can and, and not sneak so much because uh, our CBS reviewers are super super smart and they catch everything uh, that we that we throw at them and, and make comments on it which is great because we need we need their support but I'm curious you know when you were um, given this assignment what, how did you approach like taking that that enormity of detail that you have in your brain and and, and distill it all down into what uh, what you're able to put into the book. I mean, I was, I was trying to focus on what each chapter required. Um, mm -hmm. It helped that you pr provided very specific guidelines with what was supposed to go in each chapter, which was very mm -hmm. helpful. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, that, that enabled <laughs> me to focus on what each one was supposed to be. Um, so, you know, what I was doing, one of the ones I did was the, the history of the empire, um, which was something mm -hmm. I'd already worked on to some extent when I wrote the Klingon Art of War. Um, there was a lot of historical stuff in there Although that was much more scattershot. I had to actually organize it into a more chronological listing. Mm -hmm. um, and just trying to focus on the stuff that we knew happened, uh, mostly from, from what we'd seen on screen. Um, and also just hints uh, of what, you know, like we know that 
there's a long history of, of both conflict and alliance between the Klingons and the Romulans. We know they fought the Tholians. Um, I brought in the Kinshaya, who were established in John M. Ford's The Final Reflection, uh, as a longtime enemy of the Klingons, the, the novel he wrote back in 1983, um, which established a lot about Klingons that was then later overwritten by the, the spinoff TV shows. But there are aspects of, of Ford's work that has still snuck into the canon. Um, and, and other details, uh, just trying to uh, give a sense of the broader history between when Kalis formed the empire and the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th century history that we've gotten on screen. Um, it helps that there's that much to work with. Um, not, I mean, just, just from what's on screen, we've got tons of stuff. Uh, in in all the TV shows, which, as I said, co we're covering 300 years of time between, you know, enter what Enterprise gave us in the 22nd century, what the original series gave us in the 23rd, and which three different spinoffs did in the 24th. But it um, it was just a it was just a question of finding what made for the most interesting story to tell in terms of and what would provide the most information for the players. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest challenge actually was the one uh, the major and minor houses. Because we, we there's only so many that have been established on screen, hmm. uh, and I made sure we, we I included all of those the ones of of the houses belonging to characters we're familiar with, but there was still a lot more that had to be worked in in order to give the breadth of of types of houses that were required for the game. So I had to pull from a lot of different sources, and and it helped that that we were able to do that. We could I could bring in stuff from various comics and novels, and and as well as what was on screen. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Jim and I are furiously in chat. Yeah, sorry. So answering, <laughs> trying, to, trying, to answer, trying, to, trying to answer questions right, in addition right. to listening to you. So I've got you. My I've apologies. You. Yeah, and Sam, you. Sam just called me out. So thanks, Sam. Oh, it's fine. I'm here to rescue you now. I'm here to rescue <laughs> um, you now. Yeah, so, no, uh, that's what, awesome. Maybe we should chat about what's coming for uh, um, anything else in support of the Klingon book. Yeah, absolutely. And we haven't really had that conversation. Uh, we have, I mean, we talked about it to some extent. Do you, do you want to uh, it's all right. do the reveal? We first? have. We have. Oh, you have. Go ahead. Well, go yeah, ahead. Why don't you guys, you're the boss. So why don't you tell, <laughs> tell the world? <laughs> yeah, we have a couple of things coming that are in development right now. We haven't talked about yet, but we're happy to talk about it on the panel and we'll be announcing properly, obviously, as we get more like product mock ups and everything out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, st we're still working on, obviously, like a GM pack. Uh, GM screen type thing for uh, for this for the Klingon book specifically. Um, not going to match the huge size of the Borg cube version, the big mm. square, what we called like the record uh, disc uh, yes. pack. <laughs> um, but we are yeah going to have a like, GM screen thing there, uh, and then we've also got some Klingon dice in the works as well. Just one design of those, um, and they'll have little challenge dice too with the little Klingon. Uh, Empire insignia on the uh, effect side. Yes, yeah, well. so, so clever people spotted that we were using those insignia in the book for yeah. the uh, <laughs> effects. Bit of a giveaway, but uh, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did want to I throw back to... briefly to, sorry, yeah. Chris, a couple of, okay. uh, here, here a little bit more uh, from maybe Derek and Kelly. Kelly, maybe like, um, like what was your, what was your research process like for the sections that you were working on? What did you dive into? What did you read up on? Did you watch all episodes on Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty, pretty similar to Nathan's process here. So nice. for the sidebars that I was assigned, you know, I, there was a general topic and I went back through and watched every episode that is relating to that. Um, as my good friend Scott Pearson taught me, uh, Memory Alpha is a good place to start and to kind of guide you in a direction, but you have to eventually end up back at the screen to get the actual content. So I think my favorite one was um, writing about uh, Martok becoming chancellor. And so I got to I got to go back and watch his whole arc. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a really awesome character arc um, that he <laughs> follows. And then I also got to go back and uh, look at um, Lursa and Betor. And they're some of my favorite yeah. Klingon characters. Cool. So it's, it's always cool to get to go back and revisit uh, these characters on screen for research. Yeah, yeah, of course. Awesome. Uh, and, then, and then Derek, I mean, this is your second time writing uh for us uh originally yeah. the delta book how did the how was the process different or how was the approach different obviously we've talked a bit about tone of the of the two types of book like from the starfleet starfleet perspective and the klingon perspective kind of what how did you approach that what was your what was your take on that well the first thing that i uh 
realized, I sat down to write and I'm like, wait a minute, I can't use any of the Starfleet or Federation classifications for planets because, right? right? Because the Cleons aren't going to say class M or class, they don't care about that kind of stuff. So I remember I, I emailed Jim and he was like, all right, well, come up with something. I was like, oh, great, <laughs> thanks. So, <laughs> so then I, I just really thought about the Cleon mindset and just stripped it down. What do they really care about? If it's habitable, if they can conquer it, if they can use it. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're Cleons, right? So yeah. I thought about, and then I um found words in Cleon that, you know, that fit that mm. and made up their classification system. And I think... um. Amazing. Um, that was like one of the the, the, the first challenges. Mm-hmm. Then I got to stretch in certain places. Like I, mm-hmm. I did a sidebar um, with with Khan, um, which was really cool, and um, and creating the uh, the, uh, the 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 Cleon, um, I guess you could say the Cleon um, intelligence division, the unseen. Mm-hmm. So that was that was pretty cool because I I realized in canon we'd seen the Upside in Order, the Talon Shiar, we'd seen Section Thirty One. But I really didn't think we've seen anything from the Cleons, and this might be a great opportunity to have that in the game because that's something that the players and GM could, could you know, latch onto and 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 just go crazy with. So yeah. those are the two things that really stood out for me. Yeah, I really mm-hmm. value the licensor CBS. Actually, they they really allow you some space, mm-hmm. right? Yes, I didn't know that was going to get you know thrown out or anything. Yeah. You're absolutely right. CBS has been great for this. So. Yeah, it, mm-hmm. it is amazing. The, I have worked. I have worked for over 30 different licensed universes over the course of my career. And the people uh, at CBS, uh, first Paula Block when I first started and later John Van Sitters and Dayton Ward now have just been absolute joys to work with. Um, Mm -hmm. They've, they've, they've really been very supportive um, of, of doing things like what Derek was just talking about, about being able to, you know, color outside the lines a little bit where, where there's room to play with it. Uh, Not being incredibly hidebound about anything. Um, and sometimes even coming up with ideas on their own. I mean, the Klingon Art of War book that I did originated with John Van Sitters. It's, there are very few licenses where really cool book ideas come from the licensing people. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But, but in, with Star Trek, it happens all the time. And it's, it's one of the best things about working in this particular license. I think mm-hmm. something great Absolutely. about Star Trek is that they, CBS really embraces um, the creation and, and addition to the universe. And when we first started, um, you know, we were like, well, can we do this and can we do that? And they were like, sure. You know, I mean, obviously <laughs> that you've got the different levels, uh, alpha and prime, <laughs> but it was really exciting to be able to, to extend the universe. And one thing actually, which does cross over with Klingon and we've only got um, about less than 10 minutes left. So I just want to quickly cover off. Uh, I don't know if you remember Sam. So we were looking for a, uh, if, if it was D and D, there was the classic keep on the borderlands, which was your kind of base of oh, operations. Yeah. And we wanted to come up with something for the play test that's, that's coming up in a new product that uh, sat across the, you know, the, the worlds. And, and a, an episode I've always really loved was Yesterday's Enterprise, um, where if you remember um, uh, Picard and the crew are rocking along and then suddenly they're, in, well, they're in different outfits and you're like, what's going on? And they've, they've stumbled across, across this uh, anomaly and a broken, battered uh, enterprise comes through. And what's happened is they've got to fix it up and send it back uh, because it's got to be destroyed, defending uh, the Klingon colony on Narenda 3. So we proposed um, after, um, you know, after that episode, what if there was a, uh, a kind of um, uh, a political uh, desire to work closer with the Klingons and they built this station named after that that uh that event that uh the station Narendra three which rick kindly helped us with uh some of the technical side as well to, to get it right and 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 cbs signed off on it we had our three playtest ships the um sort of uh, adventuring from that location and we had a whole forum with people talking as if they were you know crew and character on the station and, and one of the cool things is that is part of the Shackleton Expanse, which is our kind of big adventure area that um, uh, is coming out. I'll let Jim briefly uh, cover off. That's gonna be a big, exciting product next year. Um, and we, um, the other thing that uh, kind of inspired this is I was reading 
how Roddenberry was very much inspired um, by, um, you know, one of the Forbidden Planet movie, which is such a classic science fiction film. If you've never seen it, urge you to go and watch it. It's got Robbie the Robot in it, I think, um, who then appears in uh, all sorts of sci-fi films as a, as because they needed a robot. And it's a great, great story based on Shakespeare's The Tempest, uh, interpreted in science fiction. And I, I hear that Roddenberry was very, very affected by it and saw this crew on a ship traveling around. And, uh, and there's some great ideas in that, that we really, um, when we um, uh, you know, got together with Dayton Ward and we were kind of pitching ideas and trying to come up with this really, really high concept storyline that was um very true to the star trek concept and um and that's if that evolved into our living campaign that people have been playing and and jim maybe you just want to cover off on that we can tease a bit about what's coming with Shackles. yeah so uh, i was gonna I, I wanted to bring it kind of all together because uh, rick had a big hand in the uh, in the shackleton uh, designing the narendra station for us yeah. for the Beta Quadrant source book um, a couple couple years ago. And I remember going back and forth on email, just helping get the details right. And you had you had added so much detail into that into that deck plan for the station that <laughs> it would be a great springing off point for so many stories and possibilities there. Uh, so we put that in the Beta Quadrant book. And then of course we had the Living Campaign going on. And, and when Sam said, you know, let's do a Klingon core book, you know, and of course we had Chris's blessing to do the Klingon core book. It was like, well, there's an opportunity now to take the living campaign that where we had just finished, you know, season one online, we were providing the adventures for free to fans online. And we were, and uh, we realized how much work went into doing that living campaign and trying to keep it going and keep it alive. And it was, you know, just a ton of work that we didn't really expect when we started it, but we were like, well, how about we do, a, a, a Shackleton Expanse campaign setting, like a full-blown campaign setting in a book, sort of like how Dungeons and Dragons does for or Forgotten Realms and yeah. Dark Sun. And there, you got this huge campaign setting. You got the Shackleton Expanse is the setting, and then you've got all these adventures that can happen inside the setting, including this huge ten-part uh, epic storyline that we're going that we're developing and we're going to include in the book. So you know, a a game master can use the Shackleton Expanse as a setting for all the adventures that they want to do for. You know, whatever they feel like doing but in addition to that we've got this huge uh, storyline that we started in the living campaign that we're going to expand and fold into the book as well and add just a ton of tools for a tool for the toolbox for game masters to use um, and then in addition to that because we knew that we were developing this huge setting we wanted to make sure that we had some unique species to put into it as well and that's where um, I was able to work with uh, Dayton and Scott Pearson who originated the living campaign with, uh, with Chris uh, and Sam initially. And uh, you know Derek and Kelly are both involved in that too. And you've had the opportunity to create whole new species to add into the Shackleton Expanse. So uh, I know we've only got like a minute or two left, but how about like a, just a quick 30 second preview of your, of your cultures, uh, uh, Derek and Kelly, just to shoot, give some fans some, some taste of what's coming. You go first, Go ahead, Derek. Kelly, you go first. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, please, Kelly. <laughs> um, well, I, I can say that the species are uh, very quickly is something we haven't seen before at all in Star Trek. And so I'm happy that it's going to be uh, seen first in Star Trek Adventures. And I think the fans are going to um, really be surprised with some of the things that uh, we're doing and with the species that I've, uh, I've created. That's so cool. Uh, and Kelly? And Kelly. Yeah. Likewise, mine are going to be uh, non-humanoid and very, very different from most of the playable species in STA. I'm mm -hmm. very excited about this. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to just to clarify, uh, and I apologize for missing it. Uh, so, in addition to the to the various new species that we'll be adding in the book, uh, we're taking the opportunity because Narendra Station is a joint Klingon Federation station. The 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 intent is that the Shackleton Experience campaign book can be used with either the Starfleet Corps book or the Klingon Corps book. So if you're playing a Klingon crew, you can go right into the Shackleton Expanse as Klingons. If you're playing the Starfleet crew, you can go right into the Shackleton Expanse as a Starfleet crew. Uh, we're gonna write, er I mean, everything in the Shackleton book is being written to, so that it can be used with either the Klingons or the or Starfleet, uh, just to give you that much more flexibility. And you know, maybe you've got char Klingon characters on your Starfleet ship like Worf, or maybe you've got a, a Federation character in the officer exchange program on the on a Klingon ship, you know, you know, whatever. We're just uh, we're gonna throw all these tools at you to use to your heart's desire, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, you love it. So expect that uh, happening probably early, early twenty one. I think Q one maybe. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Chris, uh, Sam, any last words? 
Well, we've got to wrap this up. So I think yeah. we'll give everyone a little last word. Um, yeah. Just okay. let us know um, like where you are on the internet, if people want to follow you, what you're up to, and if you have any plugs you want to mention and where we can find any of that. Um, I mean, Jim, why don't we start with you? You're at the top left of the little the little overlay here. So, <laughs> and you handed it over beautifully. Why don't we start with you? Where can we find you on the internet? What are you up to? Sure, I'm uh, I'm on all the uh, Star Trek Adventures social media. You can find me at uh, uh, scribinetti.com, but I, I haven't had time to update my website in over a year and a half now because I've been working on the Klingon book uh, <laughs> almost exclusively. Uh, but I'm not hard to find uh, working on Star Trek Adventures right now and uh, just really excited to have everybody aboard. So thank you. I'll kick it over to uh, kick it over to Rick. I'm, I'm mostly on Facebook. Uh, uh, nothing, nothing big happening right now. Uh, some projects coming up later, but uh, uh, you know, I'm having a ball. Just you know, hanging out here. Very nice. Thank you, sir. Um, let's head over to Nathan then. Well, you're you're above Rick on the little overlay. Right. Where can we find you? Um, I well, all the stuff I'm working on is stuff that Modifius is working on. So um, you know, keep uh, keep appraised on Modifius' various social media channels to see what uh, uh, what comes out next. Um, I'm fairly active on Twitter on a few uh, RPG forums. Um, normally under the uh, yeah, the alias of No One Here N One Zero N Zero One H Three R Three. Very nice. Cool. All right. Kelly, where can we find you? What are you up to at the moment? I am writing several Star Trek related things and you can find me at my website at kellyfitzpatrick.com or on Twitter at Kelly Writes. Very nice. Oh, sorry. At Kelly Fitz Writes. I know my own handle. We're good. There we go. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, what about you? Uh, I'm the same. I'm working on Star Trek stuff. I'm really happy to be a part of this. And uh, anyone can find me on Twitter is where I'm usually at, theattico at uh, twitter.com. Nice, very cool. And Keith, yeah. what about yourself? Uh, if you go to decendido.net, that's a spectacularly primitive website, but it's a link dump <laughs> that has all the various methods of cyber stalking me. I update my blog regularly. I'm all over <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, occasionally on Instagram. Um, besides the Star Trek adventure stuff, I do want to mention that I'm currently doing a rewatch of Star Trek Voyager for Tor.com. Uh, and I've also been reviewing every new episode of the various new Star Trek series that CBS All Access has been doing. Um, so you can find my reviews there. And I've also done rewatches of the original series, Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. Uh, so you can find my writings about Star Trek on Tor.com. And um, and there's lots of other stuff happening. Like, like I said, go to decandido.net, <laughs> you can find it all. Very cool. Uh, as for me, you can find me around the internet at RPG Webby on most social places. Um, apart from Modifius, uh, I've also got some indie publishing going on as well. You can find that at Follow Black Cats or BlackCatsGaming.com. Um, uh, but Chris, why don't you remind us where we can find Modifius, hereabouts the internet, uh, and then sign us out. Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, last words then, um, just find us and anything forward slash Modifius. So whether it's YouTube, Twitter, um, or Facebook, um, you can obviously pre-order the Klingon core book uh, right now in the beautiful uh, collector's edition or the standard edition with awesome art. And um, don't forget to um, use the hashtag day of honor uh, when you're um, uh, talking about the show. Thank you for all our wonderful guests joining us. And uh, the next show up is the um, uh, Hero Collector, the Star Trek Online Collection. So they'll be starting in a few moments. Just bear with us as we, as we switch over. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Cheers. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Sure. See you all soon.